This is message number three in our series for such a time. And today we're going to talk about you were born for praise. Everybody shout praise. praise. Did you know that when you were created, God created you? He did so with certain reasons in mind. It's not as if God just looked, was bored one day and he said, let there be Gary. And there I was. It wasn't like God looked around at the last person he, re- he created and said, oops, that didn't turn out like I planned. And then he created you. No, both you and I were placed here by God to fulfill his divine intentions. The apostle Paul makes it clear in Ephesians 2.10. The New Living Translation says, for we are God's masterpiece. Turn to somebody and say, you're a masterpiece. Come on. You're a masterpiece. Now, the world defines masterpiece in different ways. Uh, The Mona Lisa is is considered a masterpiece, one of the most revered uh, paintings ever of this Sodom-looking kind of homely lady. And uh, (laughs) I'm just kidding, okay. How many of you have ever been in the Louvre in Paris, France, and seen the Mona Lisa? Raise your hand. A handful of you have. I've been there. I've stood in line to go in that big hall as big as this is here and she's on the wall and it's only about this, like this. I mean, you think it's huge, but it's it's not very big. And I stood there and I looked, you know, at a distance, you know, they only get about 10 feet from it and I thought, wow, this is what the world is so enamored with. This, This is a masterpiece. And then I looked around that room at all the different nationalities and the people. I thought, no, the masterpieces are right here. These are the masterpieces that God has created. You are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now that's the message that we're we're focusing on today in this series for such a time. God's placed each one of us here in this place, in this time in history, so we can be instruments in his hand used to accomplish his purposes. Of course, this phrase comes out of our our Old Testament scripture for the book of Esther when Esther was placed in a position of influence in the kingdom there. And she had a choice to intercede for the Jewish people or not. And she chose to go ahead because her uncle said, you were born for such a time as this. In Esther 4.14, as he says, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. To say the least, Esther, Esther and Mordecai lived in interesting times. Ultimately, She knew that what she had to do could also cost her life, but she did it anyway. See, I don't don't think I'd be overstating it to say that we're living in interesting times here in America. While there have been no laws passed like in her day that would annihilate Christians as people, yet we're seeing more and more blatant attempts to not only muzzle and marginalize Christians in God's Word, but outright attacks on Christians and Christian churches and organizations, as well as Christian businesses. Now, I could list multiple instances that validate that statement, but that's not what we're here for today. My purpose is to wake us up to the fact that God has placed each of us, each of us, each of you that are watching right now, he's placed us here in this nation, in this point in time in history for such a time as this. And none of this is a surprise to God. And believe me, God is not just making up his plan as he goes along. He did not place us here to panic and hide under a rock. He did not place us here to succumb to the deception of the day and to live our lives in fear. He did not place us here to get angry and be mean in our response to the enemy's attack. He did not place us here to spend our time and energy fighting temporal battles. He placed us here to declare the gospel of the kingdom, the word of the Lord Most High, to lift up Jesus, whose word says, if he is lifted up, he will draw all people unto him. That's why we're here. Thousands of years ago, God looked down through the ages of time to this very place and this very moment in history, and he saw you and I. He knew what the enemy was going to do. He knew what his people would need to do to continue to carry on his mission. And knowing all of that, he intentionally placed you and me right here, right now for such a time as this. Do I need to say that again? See, so far in this series, you've considered that you were born for a purpose. You were born for prayer. Today, we're going to discuss something that he's planned for us long ago. You were born for praise. Everybody shout praise. Praise. 
Now, most of us don't really think about it every day, but pretty much everything that we do in life is some sort of praise or worship unto God. Many people think that just a 15 minutes on a Sunday morning or ever how long it is, that's, that's it. That's our praise unto God. That's our worship. We sing, we clap our hands, we raise our hands. Of course, those are all biblical expressions of worship, but they're really just outward expressions of an inward response. You see, praise is actually a spiritual activity. That is, it happens in our hearts, in our spirits, and then it flows out of that. Genuine praise and worship is an inward response of our hearts to God his greatness and his good words. And, and that inward response always produces an outward response. When people say, well, I, I, I praise and worship God, but they never sing out loud. They never raise their hand. They never clap their hands or anything. Well, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just an introvert. Well, I'm an introvert, but that's no excuse. That's no excuse. If it's going on on the inside, it'll come on the outside. If there's praise on the inside, there'll be some praise coming on the outside. See, most people limit praise to that short time on a Sunday morning, but, but there are other expressions of praise that are so important, maybe even more important, like obedience, service, giving, an attitude of gratitude, and submission to God. If you were to say, well, that sounds just like Christian virtues to me, well, you're right. You see, our very lives are praise to the Lord. Real praise and worship is a lifestyle. Praise and worship is based on who God is, not how we feel. Say that again, it's based on who God is. We don't come before God and say, I don't feel good today. That's the greatest opportunity to praise and worship God, as we're going to see that later on in the message. See, we must be very careful not to allow the interesting times that we live in to currently to, to rob us of our praise and worship because the enemy hates it when we praise God. He'll do anything he possibly can to derail our praise. Don't let the devil steal your lifestyle of praise and worship. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice to God. Everybody say continual. Amen. Continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. You know, David didn't, didn't let unanswered prayer steal his worship when he fasted and prayed for seven days for his son that was born from Bathsheba, but he died anyway. But David didn't allow that to rob his praise from God. Hannah, who was, who was barren and had no children, didn't let unfulfilled dreams to steal her worship. She worshiped even through and though she was barren without a child and God gave her a child. Abraham didn't let the love of his family keep him from his worship or steal his worship, even though he thought it might cost him the life of his son. Job didn't let horrific loss, horrible pain steal his worship. He worshiped in spite of devastating circumstances. Joseph didn't let the pleasure of sin steal his worship. When Potiphar's wife went after him, he honored God rather than giving in to temptation. Each one of these examples, their worship was not cheap and it was not easy and it was not casual and it cost them something. I said it cost them something. You see, sometimes it costs us something to obey God. Oh, that's not a popular word at all. Let's edit that out of the message, by the way. Let's, let's not put that out. No, no, no. It costs something. Number one, it costs our will. This is not part of the message, but it's a good message. It's part of our, we, it costs our will, not my will, but I, I've, I've seen numerous people through four decades of ministry that came to church, said they loved God, they taught Sunday school, they led a life group, uh, they sang on the worship team, they played music, they did all of these things, they greeted at the door, but they, they never really said, not my will, but thy will be done. They, they only served in a position of as long as it's what I want to do and how I want to do it. That's, that's not freedom. That's not how to live. That's not how to experience the great things of God. And when praise is the same way, we don't praise God on our position. We praise, praise God for his position. See, their worship was a sacrifice that cost them something. Now, we see similar dynamic example in worship in the New Testament, a book of Acts with a guy by the name of Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas didn't let adverse circumstances and unfair treatment steal their worship. How many of you ever experienced an adverse circumstance? Wave at me. You, some, some of you are like, I'm right there. I'm, I'm experiencing it right now, Pastor. How about unfair treatment? Anybody ever had unfair treatment in your life of any kind? 
Well, they didn't let it steal their worship. You see, they worshiped in jail after being beaten for, of all things, preaching the gospel. Let's, let's set the scene of what was going on. Paul and Silas were traveling around preaching the gospel and planting churches. And so that when they came to the city of Philippi, Luke says they stayed there several days. And during that time, there was a young slave girl. And this young slave girl was demon possessed and she had the ability to tell fortune. She was a fortune teller. And so she could tell people's fortunes and she was owned by men. And so she was a slave a physical slave to those men, and she was a spiritual slave to this demonic spirit. And she would follow them around, and she was annoying them, I guess. And finally, after many days, Paul turned, and he commanded the demonic spirit to come out of her. And upon learning, and, and by the way, the demonic spirit came out of her, she was set free, at least from the spiritual bondage. She's still a slave to these men. So when these men found out that she could no longer earn them money, that her fortune telling was gone, that uh, they brought Paul and Silas to the authorities. They accused them of causing an unlawful disturbance, which was a lie. And the authorities had them severely flogged or beaten, thrown in jail. And the jailer put them in the inner cell and bound them in their feet and their hands in locks in the jail, in the inner cell. And all they'd done was delivered this beautiful young girl from the bondage of Satan. See, Satan doesn't like for God's work to be done. That's why, that's, that's why and, and, and you have to understand my heart when I say this, when I say Satan, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not accusing people. Anything that's negative that's going on in a nation, the source of it is Satan. Now, he works through people like God works through people, but the source of it is Satan. So that's our problem. People aren't our problems. You can remove those people, and guess what? A bunch more wicked people will show up, as we've seen. And that's not the issue. The issue is Satan is behind every evil thing that happens. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father above, in whom there's no variables nor shadow of turning, James chapter 1. So every good thing comes from God. Every bad thing comes from the devil. And so when we look around the landscape of our land today, the bad things, the evil things that are coming have an agenda behind it to stop the work of God. That's Satan's agenda. Always Satan's agenda is to nullify the word of God, to marginalize the word of God. To, and he's got multiple ways to do that. We could spend the whole day talking about that. But that's the bottom line of what he wants to do. It is the church's obligation. It is our obligation as children of the Most High God to be aware of the strategies of the enemy, to understand Jesus, the word of God says we are, we are not ignorant concerning the, the old King James says wiles. It means strategies of the devil. And that's why I can look at something. I can see it clearly. I'm not deceived by it. And somebody else over here that doesn't have a clue is not in connect with, not serving God, not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, not really walking with the Lord, look at it and they see something totally different. They're just, they're consumed by the deception of what's going on. And I can look at it and see what it is immediately. It's very plain. It's the same old, same old. Satan's not a creator. He's a perverter. So his playlist really never changes through the decades. He may change the tune a little, but the song is the same. The strategy is the same. And when you see it, you can recognize it. Now, and their point here was to stop Paul and Silas from preaching the gospel, bringing the gospel of the kingdom, delivering people, seeing people saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, healed and delivered. That's what they were there for, but now they're in prison. What do they do? They, they experience public publicly lied about them. They were unfairly judged. They were treated with other disrespect. Does that sound like the news? They were illegally beaten with rods. They were thrown in jail without a hearing or a trial. Their act of kindness of delivering this young lady was met with brutal violence. So their response was not what most expected. Here's what their response was. Acts 16, 25 and 26. At midnight, everybody say at midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. In the deep, dark dungeon, in that cavernous area that was dark and damp and rock walls, the echoes of two men in the inner part of the dungeon began to reverberate through those walls and down the hallway and, and, and just echoed around and all the prisoners were listening. They were all awake and listening. I, I, wonder, I wonder what they were singing. I wonder, I wonder what they were singing that night. 
Now, of course, we don't know the songs that they sang back then, but, but in, in our day, what, what would, they, would they have been singing? Victory in Jesus. My Savior forever. He sought me. He bought me with his redeeming blood. Maybe, 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 maybe they, maybe they had a little Andre Crouch in them and they were singing, through it all, through it all. I, some of you know what? I've learned to trust in Jesus. Yeah, I've learned to trust in God through it all. Mm -hmm. They were, they were singing. Maybe they were singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. My song will rise to thee. Whatever they were singing, the prisoners were listening. It changed the atmosphere of the prison. You see, you can let the atmosphere change you or you can change the atmosphere. It's totally up to you as to what you want to do. What is our first response to trouble, worry, anger? Is it praise? The answer to that question is important because it will determine our direction. Do you think the story would have unfolded as, if, as it did if Paul and Silas had have griped with anger and fear and whined and complained? Why did God let us get in this situation? No, I think they'd still be in jail today. But as they prayed, an earthquake shook. That next verse said the prison began to shake. It shook the stocks off their feet. It shook them. See, praise will give you a breakthrough. You see, and, and that's, that's one of the things I want you to get today is that praise is the pathway into his presence. Say that with me. Praise is the pathway into his presence. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving and go into his courts with what? With praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. A few days ago I read Joshua chapter 5 as part of our daily Bible reading guide. And I posted it on our Facebook, I did a Facebook Live with it. Joshua 5 is a transition chapter where God is preparing Israel to go into the promised land after spending 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, they shared Passover together, and on that day of the Passover, they ate the produce of the land. The manna ceased, and then that Joshua, that's when Joshua saw the man standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. Here's the word in Joshua 5, 13 and 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And so he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. In other words, I'm with you. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth in worship and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot. For the place where you stand is holy. Now, as I read that a few days ago, I saw something I'd never seen before. In verse 14, Joshua asked, what does, my, what does the Lord say to my servant? See, Joshua was preparing to go on to attack Jericho, and now the commander of the Lord's army was here. So it was, it was, it was logistically sound to ask, ask him for the plan. He assumed he'd come with a battle plan. And so like a good leader, he, he asked that question, but the angel responds with these words. Take your sandal off for your, this, this place where you stand is holy. And this is what the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart. Before you prepare your hands for battle, you must prepare your heart for praise. I will say it again. Before you prepare your hands for battle, you got to prepare your heart for praise and through praise. Intimacy with God produces influence with man. I'll say it again, intimacy with God produces influence with man. Say it with me. Intimacy with God produces influence with man. The presence of God releases the power of God. That's where the power of God comes through. It doesn't come through religious classes. It comes through the manifestation of the presence of God. That's where the power of God comes. Praise is the pathway into his presence. I just like to get in the presence of the Lord. Start praising him. Well, I don't really feel like it. <laughs> Start praising God whether you feel like it or not. You lift up your voice and begin to praise Him. 
Worship Him. Praise God. Praise His name. Praise His wondrous works. Praise Him. God, I praise You. I worship You. I praise You, Lord God. Praise is a pathway into His power. And praise is not a ritual. It's a relationship. Oh, if I could get this through to the church today and many churches today that is nothing more than a ritual. Psalms 81.10 says, I am the Lord, your God. Everybody say, your God. your God. See, God wants to be your God, not just a God a some, or someone else's God, but your God. Turn to somebody and say something about you. I want you to put your hand over your heart and say this out loud. God is my God. He's my God. He's my God. So you've got to take ownership. He's your God. It's relational. It's personal. It's you and God. He's not Pastor, just Pastor Gary's God. I want to say this about the church family here. This is my church because I take ownership here of, of being a part of this family. But I don't own anything here except my desk and, and my office. That's all I own here. That, that I mean, if, if I'm gone tomorrow, I don't even know if I'd take it. But I, it's, it's heavy. And, and <laughs> would take that thing home with me. Well, I don't even know where I'm going to put it. And the garage with the other stuff, I guess, so I can't park my truck. And, and I, that's, that's all I own, but it's mine. It's mine, see. This is my country. I thank God for America. I still believe in America. I still believe in the red, white, and blue. I still believe in standing up and honoring the flag and putting your hand over your heart when the Star Spangled Banner is. I still believe in that. I don't own much of it. I've got just a little lot there where my house sits. That's all I have ownership, but it's my country. And I'd still die for my country if they call on me to do that. It's my country. Well, just like that, this is your church. You may not even have a desk here, but it's your church. And when you take ownership, it releases something into your life. It releases a power in your life. And when you take ownership, he's my God. He's not just a God. He's not the God, but he's my God. Everybody shout, he's my God. When the Ark of the Covenant was restored to Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6, 14, David danced before the Lord with all his might. He was the king of Israel, and yet he was down in the street close to the Ark of the Covenant. No bodyguards were around him. He was down there just, I mean, as we would say growing up on the farm, cutting a jig. He was dancing before the Lord. It wasn't a ritual for King David. He wasn't putting a show on for anybody. He was so thrilled the presence of God was coming back into Israel. It was about relationship. The great author and preacher A.W. Tozer once said, Worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ within us. The book of Psalms has 150 chapters, which contains a total of 2,461 verses. The very last chapter and the very last verse reads Psalm 150, verse 6, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Say it again, let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Do you have breath? Are you in everything? Then we're called to praise the Lord. And here's the last thing. Praise is a weapon that defeats the devil. The first mention of praise is in the Bible. It's the birth of Jacob's son Judah in Genesis 29, 35. The name Judah means praise. No matter where you see the name Jude in the Bible, it always means praise. Now let's fast forward from Genesis to Revelation 5.5. 5. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold the lion. Everybody say lion. lion. The lion of the what? Tribe of Judah. He's not the lion of the tribe of Dan. He's not the lion of the tribe of Issachar. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of praise. It's interesting in 1 Peter 5, 8, the New King James Version, we read, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. He is not a roaring lion. He's an imitation. He's an imposter. Why do you think he goes about like a roaring lion? Because he knows Jesus is the real lion the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he goes around seeking whom he may devour. He's an imposter. He always tries to copy what God is doing. He has no power. He has no authority except what we give him. He's like the lion, the cowardly lion on the Wizard of Oz. That's all he is. All it takes is for one little girl to stand up and slap his face for him to run off into the woods. Come on, church. 
That's what he is. And when you praise God, you slap the cowardly lion in the face and he tucks his tail and he runs off. Don't ever get up and say, oh, the devil's really after me. Turn around and get after him. Grab your skirt and run after him. Slap him on the face and go. And somebody says, you know what? We need to defend Jesus in this time that we're living in. No, we don't need to defend Jesus. We need to open the cage and let the lion out. He'll defend himself. He'll take care of it. We don't need to defend Jesus. We just need to preach Jesus and proclaim Jesus. We don't need to hide inside the four walls and hide from the rhetoric of the world today. We need to stand up and boldly declare Jesus is Lord. And when you declare that, the lion will defend himself. He can take care of himself. After the death of their leader, Joshua and Judges 1, the people of Israel were against the formidable enemy, the Canaanites. When they asked God who should go up first, the Lord found this, said this in Judges 1, 2. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. What he was saying was praise goes first. He said, indeed, I have delivered the land into this hand. God was saying the first attack of the enemy should be praise. It's just praising God, praising, praising. How many battles are you fighting right now? Are you fighting a battle against fear, against depression, against doubt? If your battle is for an unsaved family member, a co-worker, or children, or for your health, maybe your battle is against temptation, addictions, destructive thoughts, even insecurity. How are you fighting those battles? Are you fighting with verbal assaults against those who have verbally assaulted you? Remember what happened as they sang praises at midnight. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly. suddenly. There was a massive earthquake. The prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open. The chains of every prisoner fell off. You see, when you praise God, you set up an atmosphere for not only you to experience the power of God, but you set an atmosphere up for other people. You want the people in your office to be, be touched by God, you become a praiser. You want the people in your work crew and your construction crew, you become a praiser. Now that doesn't mean that you go there every day and you're singing praise music all the time. Remember, it comes from the heart, but you got to be singing it sometime. Instead of complaining, oh God, may, help me to make it through today on your way to work. Help me, oh Lord to make it through another day. Why don't you spend that time praising God? Send Judah first into the battle and lift his name up and praise him all the way into the parking lot and all the way into you get to your cubicle or your station or your place in the warehouse or, or in your office or, or there at the, at the hospital or wherever you're working. And when you get there, you just praise your way in. You might be surprised at what happens when Judah goes first in your life. If you're fighting a battle, maybe it's change, time to change the way you fight it. See, God is indeed a master of taking the weapon meant for our destruction out of the enemy's hand and using it to defeat him. So what the enemy intended for harm, God used for good. The key, as we see here, is the attitude and the heart position of Paul and Silas. Instead of letting their circumstances change their praise and worship, their praise and worship changed their circumstances. Instead of letting their circumstances, you say, well, you, you don't know what I'm going through. Are you in jail? Maybe you're out on probation, but you're not in jail here. Okay. <laughs> or, or have you been beaten with, with, and your back's bleeding with stripes right now? I mean, blood's flowing out of it. Or are you locked right now in a deep, damp, dark prison with your feet and your hands in stocks, hungry, thirsty, your you're back in excruciating pain and all of the pain that goes on, along with that. It, all for preaching and praying for somebody that got delivered? No. I'm not making light of anything that you and I are going through. I'm just saying if these boys can do it, we can do it. If they in that extreme situation can do it, you and I can do it as well. They were born for such a time as that. That's why they were there. You and I were born for such a time as this. That's why we're here. 
Yes, we find ourselves in challenging times. Yes, things are changing. We don't know what's going to happen, but we know that someone who does. But God placed you and me here for such a time as this for purpose, for prayer, and for praise. So when you begin to get worried and discouraged and angry about all the things you see around you and what's happening to you, just remind yourself that you can either complain and remain or you can praise and be raised. One of the two, it's your choice in your life. That's your choice. Give the Lord praise here this morning. That's it, praise. Everybody shout praise. praise. So I was born to praise. Born That's a little weak. I was born to praise. Born to praise. What kind of church are you anyway? <laughs> were you born to praise? Yeah. I say, were you born to praise? Yeah. Of course you were. God created you and put you here. So let's get to it. Let's, get, let's just get to it in your own life. I tell you, when this parking lot empties this morning, there'll be people driving down the road. Got their hands out the window, heads out the window, <laughs> hair blowing for those of you that have it. A lot of people, they'll drive up to the stop like next to you and you're over there going. They say, yeah, they go to that church. All right. Uh -huh. And they ought to as well. You and I decide how we fight the battles. We fight it. Judah goes first. You see, why out of four messages did you include praise? Couldn't you have come up with something more relevant to us than that? No, it is relevant. We, we need to learn and understand the art of warfare through praise. Praise is a key component of intercessory prayer. You enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So if that's the key to get in, if that's the key, I think we ought to use it. I got a key to get in my house. I have a key to get in my truck. I have a key to get in this church. I have a key to get in my office. Do you have keys to get in the places you want to go? Praise is the key to unlock the door to the presence of God. And then you can do some business when you get there. <laughs> 